<laughs> Albert Einstein was a genius. On December the 31st, 1999, Time Magazine selected Albert Einstein as the person of the century. Well, that's what they would have you believe. But while I was researching the origin of the theory of relativity, I discovered the unthinkable. Historians are claiming Albert Einstein was a fraud, a plagiarist, and a wife beater, among other things. But what really surprised me was that he had an affair with Marilyn Monroe. So first we have to talk about the fact that Einstein was not a genius. On the website Nidorama, they have a blog post titled 10 Strange Facts About Einstein. And number four is, Einstein failed his university entrance exam. It says in 1895 at the age of 17, Albert Einstein applied for early admission into the Swiss Federal Polytechnical School. He passed the math and science sections of the entrance exam, but failed the rest, including history, languages, geography, etc. Einstein had to go to a trade school before he retook the exam and finally admitted to ETH a year later. And this website again it confirms that Einstein in fact did fail an examination that would have allowed him to study for a diploma as an electrical engineer at the ETH. So on this website PBS 13 in the article Einstein the Nobody, they're going to talk about people having to pull strings to get Einstein a job and how bad Einstein's grades were. So it says here, a friend of Einstein from the university, Marcel Grossman, had pulled the right strings to get Einstein the patent job in 1902. Grossman's help was necessary, not so much, because Einstein's final university grades were unusually low. Through cramming with the ever useful Grossman's notes, Einstein had just managed to reach 4.91 average of a possible 6, which was almost average. But because one professor, furious at Einstein for telling jokes and cutting classes, had spitefully written unacceptable references. Teachers over the years had been irritated by his lack of obedience, most notably Einstein's high school Greek grammar teacher, Joseph Degenhardt, the one who has achieved immortality in the history books through insisting that nothing will ever become of you. Later, when told it would be best if he left the school, Degenhardt had explained, your presence in the class destroys the respect of the students. Now here it says after Einstein had gotten the job at the patent office, he had applied for a promotion from third class to second class. His supervisor, Dr. Frederick Haller, had rejected him, writing in an assessment that although Einstein had displayed some quite good achievements, he would still have to wait until he has become fully familiar with mechanical engineer. This is a genius to you guys? Someone has to explain this. This guy's supposed to be a genius. So far, he dropped out of high school. He needed someone to pull strings for him to get a job at a patent office. He was a third class clerk. He couldn't even get up to a second class. He couldn't even get the promotion. And you guys have been telling me for years, this guy's a genius. Let's keep going. Let's go to about.com, article on Albert Einstein, the humble genius. It says here, and I want you to remember this age because this is gonna be very important. When Einstein was 15 years old, his father's new business had failed, and the Einstein family moved to Italy. At first, Albert remained behind in Germany to finish high school, but he was soon unhappy with that arrangement and left school to rejoin his family. He dropped out of high school. Yes, Albert Einstein dropped out of high school. Now again, it says rather than finish high school, Einstein decided to apply directly to the prestigious Polytechnical Institute in Switzerland, and of course he failed. 15 years old, dropped out of high school. Try to get into a technical school, failed. This is your genius. Here it says, right after Einstein was born, relatives were concerned with Einstein's pointy head. Then when Einstein didn't talk until he was three years old. I want you to remember this. Three years old. This genius, <laughs> this genius didn't talk until he was three years old. His parents worried something was wrong with him. Einstein also failed to impress his teachers. From elementary school through college, his teachers and professors thought him lazy, sloppy, and insubordinate. Many of his teachers thought he would never amount to anything, and he never did. It's all a scam. It's a fraud. This is not a genius. He didn't talk till he was three years old. <laughs> How do you explain that, man? Your genius didn't talk till he was three 
years old. I want you to remember these ages. Three years old and 15. Dropped out of high school, 15. Didn't talk to was three. Remember that, because I'm going to show you some real geniuses right after this. Now, when we look at the book, Cognitive Evolution, The Biological Imprint of Applied Intelligence, we get a very interesting quote from the Encyclopedia Britannica, the 2007 edition. It says here, In Munich, Einstein attended rigidly disciplined schools. Under the harsh and pedantic regimentation of the 19th century German education, which he found intimidating and boring, he showed little scholastic ability. He left secondary school without a diploma. Again, this is from the Encyclopedia Britannica, 2007. You can go and look it up. Moving forward, when we go to the book On the Shoulders of Giants, we see a very interesting quote. It says, in 1895, Einstein attempted to skip high school by passing an entrance examination to the Federal Polytechnical School in Zurich, which he hoped to pursue a degree in electrical engineering. This is what he wrote about his ambition at the time. If I were to have the good fortune to pass my examinations, I would go to Zurich. I would stay there for four years in order to study mathematics and physics. I imagine myself becoming a teacher in those branches of natural sciences, choosing the theoretical part of them. Here are the reasons which lead me to this plan. Above all, it is my disposition for abstract and mathematical thought and my lack of imagination and practical ability. Lack of imagination and practical ability. Someone explain this to me. This is your genius. Now in this section, I want to talk about real geniuses. All right, so let's look at our first genius. We have a black female named Love, a 15-year-old who earned perfect ACT and SAT scores. Remember I told you guys at the age of 15, Albert Einstein dropped out of high school? Do you think he could have passed the ACT or the SAT at the age of 15 when he flunked an examination test? Huh? Let's keep going. It says here, Love's latest ACT, SAT, PSAT, and AP scores all perfect. Symbolize the payoff for a lot of hard work. Wow. Then we have this Indian student who gets perfect SAT score in the UAE. It says here, a 15-year-old Indian student has got perfect scholastic aptitude test score in the UAE. Sanchez Kapoor has scored 2,400 in the coveted SAT held on November the 7th. Then we have this California boy, 14, who gets perfect score on SAT. Varan John, a precocious middle schooler from East Bay, walked away from the SAT with a score of 2,400. How do you guys explain that? This guy's smarter than Einstein. Then we have another guy, Belair Anthony Young, gets perfect SAT and ACT scores. I mean, this is ridiculous. Perfect score in SAT. Uh, Then we have this other student who gets a perfect score in the AP test and SAT. I mean, guys, you have to explain this to me. 11-year-old scores higher higher than Einstein on the Mensa IQ test. Everyone is scoring higher than Einstein because he was a flippin' idiot. It says here, Romani has invited to take the IQ test after writing an essay for Oxford University that received an impressive score. He scored an IQ of 162, placing him in the top 1% in the UK. He said that he was surprised by his score because he wasn't confident about the test when he completed it. Romani has earned all the bragging rights, but with his brilliance comes much modesty. Then we have this young fella, Joshua Beckford, the youngest kid to attend Oxford University. You can- <laughs> Remember, Einstein dropped out of school at the age of 15. He couldn't talk till he was three. This guy can't be more than 10. Huh? Maybe seven. <laughs> Let's look at the age. Age eight. What? Talk to me. Age eight, you're probably practicing the sport or was preparing for the third grade. Well, meet an eight-year-old with a twist, Joshua Beckford. This particular young boy is by far not your average eight-year-old. He studied at Oxford University at the age of six. At the age of six, Einstein just started talking at three. I mean, he could barely... (laughs) He could barely string words together, okay? (laughs) All right, so... He's face of he's the face of the National Autistic Society's Black and Minority Campaign. It's put into place to highlight the obstacle that people with Black minority background often encounter when trying to obtain the access to support and services they need. Beckford is one of a kind. He is too advanced for his required school grade, so that led him into being homeschooled. He excels in math, 
foreign languages, history, philosophy, IT, and science. A professor at City University named him one of the smartest kids in the world. Einstein dropped out of school, he couldn't pass an examination test, and later we're going to talk about his plagiarism. I mean, this is sad that you guys keep talking about Einstein when you have people that are smarter than Einstein, didn't plagiarize, weren't wife beaters, weren't sociopaths, right? And the list goes on. But let's look at this young girl here. Three year old! <laughs> three year old girl scores off the charts in the UK. At three year old, Einstein just started to talk. How do you explain this to me? How do you explain this to me, man? This is a genius, right? Three year old scores off the charts in IQ tests as she teaches herself Spanish on an iPad. At the age of three, Einstein couldn't even talk. He gave a buckle of shoes. <laughs> and y'all call him a genius. Y'all better stop that nonsense, man. Now here we have four-year-old genius invited to Mensa. This is four-year-old. A year after Einstein could talk, she's already, what, she learned the alphabet at four months of age. Then at 18 months, learned numbers in Spanish. The precociously intelligent youngster claims she's smarter than her parents and both mom and dad agree. Here we have 12-year-old genius goes to Morehouse College. Huh? 15-year-old Einstein dropped out of high school and you got a 12-year-old going to college. How do you guys explain that? You talking about genius? Cut it out, man. This is ridiculous. Let's keep going. This amazing African-American student, 12-year-old Stephen Stafford, was primarily homeschooled by his mother. This mathematics and science prodigy was accepted to Morehouse College. He's currently in his second year and he is still excelling. Wow. Let's talk about Einstein being a damn fraud and plagiarist, man. All right, so in this article from the website Veterans Day, it asks the question, was Einstein a wife beater, a womanizer, plagiarizer, and eugenicist? They continue by saying, the mathematician Roger Schlafly has recently revived the long forgotten argument that much of what is credited to Einstein has been the work of others. The noted mathematician Henri Poincaré and physicist Hendrik Lawrence wrote about relativity long before Einstein ever thought about the topic. Einstein just made them popular without giving credit to whom it is due. They continue by saying, This point was articulated by a British mathematician and historian of science, Sir Edmund T. Whitaker, who wrote in his work, A History of the Theories of Ether and Electricity, that the equation E equals mc squared was the creation of Lawrence and Poincaré, which is a French name, Poincaré, right? I was about to say Poncaire. <laughs> Poncaire. Poncaire. Huh? What do you guys have to say about that? All right, so Einstein's friend and colleague Max Born had even tried to persuade Whitaker not to publish his opinion. They're trying to cover up the truth. But Born himself later admitted that it was highly plausible that Einstein got his idea from Poncaire. Similar points were made by Russian physicist A.A. A. Longinov in his book, Henri Poncaire and the Relativity Theory. They continue by saying it was after he was confronted with this fact by Whitaker that Einstein hoped that posterity would give Lorenz and Poncre some credit to the theory. As biographer Albrecht Folsen puts it, after nearly half a century, this was the first time that Einstein ever mentioned Poncre in connection with the special relativity theory. Wow. And here's a picture of Hendrik Lorenz. This is who Einstein stole from, this old man. So here again, when we go to Wikipedia, it says he also derived the transformation equations subsequently used by Albert Einstein to describe space and time. Look, man, Einstein is a friggin' thief. Point blank, period. All right, so now let's look at Henri Poincaré. Here is a picture of the man that Einstein stole from. So here it says, Albert Einstein's first paper on relativity in 1905 derived the Lorentz transformation and presented them in the same form as had Poincaré. It was published three months after Poincaré's first paper, but before Poincaré's longer version appeared in 1906. Although Einstein relied on the principle of relativity and used the same clock synchronization procedure that Poincaré had described, his paper was remarkable in that it had no reference at all. Could you imagine writing a college paper and not putting in any references? No work cited? No sources? This is what your genius did. Your Albert Einstein 
stole from these two individuals, completely plagiarized, copy and paste, and didn't put any references. And to this day, no one is asking the question, hey, hold on a second, brother. You ain't no genius. We know that. But how the hell did you write a paper and not put any references? Someone explain that to me. This is your genius. Right? When we go to the book, The Golden Age of Theoretical Physics, Selected Essays, let's see what it says. As to the question whether Einstein was aware of Lorentz's 1904 memoir, Einstein had published seven papers, all of them in the Annalen des Physique, one of the most prestigious journals of the day, during the period of 1901 to 1905, before publishing his paper on the electrodynamics of moving media in the same journal. He was therefore definitely in close contact with the current ideas of physics, but there was a conspicuous peculiarity about this memoir on special relativity. As Max Born said, the striking point is that it contains not a single reference to the previous literature. It gives the impression of quite a new venture. But this of course is not true. Only Born said it in 1956, a year after Einstein's passing. This guy waited a year to come out with the truth. And you guys are popping this guy up, putting him on a pedestal, worshipping him. You're a genius. You're smart like Einstein. Einstein was a friggin' idiot. Plagiarist. Womanizer. Wife beater. Sociopath. Huh? Neglected his children. Talk to me. Let's go to this website. Allis.com. It says here, Einstein's explanation is a dimensional disguise for Lorentz. Thus, Einstein's theory is not a denial of, nor an alternative for, that of Lorentz. It is only a duplicate in disguise for it. Einstein continually maintains that the theory of Lorentz is right, only he disagrees with the interpretation. It is not clear, therefore, that in this case, as in other cases, Einstein's theory is merely a disguise for Lorentz. The apparent disagreement about interpretations being a matter of words only? So now here is where Einstein is going to completely lie as if he did not steal from this guy. Here it says, Poincaré wrote 30 books and over 500 papers on philosophy, mathematics, and physics. Einstein wrote on mathematics, physics, and philosophy, but claimed he had never read Poincaré's contributions to physics. This guy is blatantly lying. Blatantly. This is who you guys, you know, put on a pedestal. Einstein, you're smart as Einstein. Get the hell out of here. Here we go again. Yet many of Poincaré's ideas, for example, the speed of light is a limit and that mass increases with speed, wound up in Einstein's paper on the electrodynamics of moving bodies without being credited. Without being credited. So they go on to say that in his 1907 paper, Einstein spelled out his views on plagiarism. Let's see what he thinks about plagiarism now. This is your genius. This is your, <laughs> your plagiarist, right? It appears to me that it is the nature of the business that what follows has already been partly solved by other authors. Despite the fact, since the issues of concerns are here addressed from a new point of view, I'm entitled to leave out a thoroughly pedantic survey of the literature. Huh? Excuse me? You can just leave out your sources? Does this make any sense to you guys? Does that make any sense? So now let's look at the history of E equals MC squared. It says, who originated the concept of matter being transformed into energy and vice versa? It dates back to Sir Isaac Newton, 1704. Brown, 1967, made the following statement. Thus gradually arose the formula E equals MC squared, suggested without general proof by Poincaré in 1900. Bjorkman suggested as a possible candidate S. Tover Preston, who formulated atomic energy, the atom bomb, and superconductivity back in the 1870s based on the formula E equal mc squared. They continue by saying, in addition to Presto, a major player in the history of E equals mc squared who deserves much credit is Orento de Preto, which makes this timing so suspicious is that Einstein was fluent in Italian. He was reviewing papers written by Italian physicists, and his best friend was Michel Besso, a Swiss Italian. Clearly, Einstein would have had access to the literature and the competence to read it. In Einstein's E equals MC square was Italian's idea. We see clear evidence that Di Preto was ahead of Einstein in terms of the formula E equals MC square. So basically, Einstein thought he was above the law. He believed that he was above scientific protocol. He thought he could bend the rules to his own liking and get away with it. Hang in there long enough and his enemies would die off and his followers would win the day. 
and signs the last follower standing wins and gets to write history it seems. In the case of Einstein, his blatant and repeated dalliance and plagiarism is all but forgotten and his followers have borrowed repeatedly from the discoveries of other scientists and used them to adorn Einstein's halo. You guys have allowed Einstein to steal and then you have put him on a pedestal, a plagiarist, stealing from other scientists. You guys must repent. You guys must repent. And I'm not talking everyone that's watching this video. I'm talking you guys that have been worshiping Einstein, putting him on a pedestal. He's a genius. I want to be like Einstein. Einstein is a plagiarist. Huh? Talk to me. All right. Let's go to a section I call Womanizer and Wife Beater. So in this article from the website Nidorama, titled 10 Strange Facts About Einstein, we see that number five is Einstein had an illegitimate child. It says in the 1980s, Einstein's private letters reveal something new about the genius. He had an illegitimate daughter with a fellow former student, Meliva Marek, whom Einstein later married. In 1902, a year before their marriage, Meliva gave birth to a daughter named Lazaro, whom Einstein never saw and whose fate remained unknown. And then we have number six. Einstein became estranged from his first wife, then proposed a strange contract. After Einstein and Mileva married, they had two sons, Hans Albert and Edward. Einstein's academic successes and world travel, however, came at a price. He became estranged from his wife. For a while, the couple tried to work out their problems. Einstein even proposed a strange contract for living together with Mileva. It says, number one, you will make sure that my clothes and laundry are kept in good order. Number two, you will make sure that I will receive my three meals regularly in my room. Number three, you will make sure that my bedroom and study are kept neat, and especially that my desk is left for my use only. You will renounce all personal relations with me insofar as they are not completely necessary for social reasons. There's more, including you will stop talking to me if I request it. She accepted these conditions. He later wrote to her again to make sure she grasped that this was going to be all business in the future and that the personal aspects must be reduced to a tiny remnant. And he vowed, in return, I assure you of proper compartment on my part, such as I would exercise to any woman as a stranger. Wow, she actually accepted those conditions. Then we go to the website Veterans Today. Article title was Einstein, a wife beater, womanizer, plagiarizer, and eugenicist. And it says here, Einstein, like Charles Darwin before him, embarked on a sexual relationship with his cousin, Elsa Einstein, huh? Who had been divorced since 1908 and had two daughters aged 15 and 13. Now, going back to the website Nidorama in the article 10 Strange Facts About Einstein, number eight is, Einstein was a ladies' man. It says, after Einstein divorced Mileva, his infidelity was listed as one of the reasons for the split. He soon married his cousin, Elsa Lowenthal. Actually, Einstein also considered marrying Elsa's daughter from her first marriage, Ilse, but she demurred. The number seven, we have Einstein didn't get along with his oldest son. Hans blamed his father for leaving Mileva, and after Einstein won the Nobel Prize and money, for giving Mileva access only to the interest rather than the principal sum of the award, thus making her life that much harder financially. This is your genius, right? Then on the website, The Voice of Nation, we have an article titled, History's Greatest Physicist, Albert Einstein, Use His Wife for Sex and Indulge in Incestuous Affair with Cousin. Here it goes on to say, his wife, as good as a maid, his children were just a product of sexual intercourse, not love. Voted the greatest physicist of all time by Physics World and revered for his intellectual and scientific contributions, Einstein was from inside a selfish man. Now when we look at the website Glamour.com, we have an article titled, Five Things You Didn't Know About Marilyn Monroe. It says here, number one, Marilyn may have had an affair with Albert Einstein. In the late 1940s, the actress Shelley Winters shared an apartment with Marilyn Monroe, and in her autobiography, Winters claimed that Monroe had hinted about a dalliance with the genius. When we go to the website funtrivia.com, we have someone asking the question, did Marilyn Monroe and Albert Einstein ever meet? The person said, yes, they did. 
Just like Marilyn and the Kennedy brothers, Marilyn and Einstein not only met, but had affairs and were actually quite fond of each other. Here is one of the many links. So again, you can go ahead and check that link out. And then we have a blog post about their affair titled Marilyn Monroe and Albert Einstein, Their Secret Love Affair. You can go and check that out. Now, when we go to the website, davidike.com in the forum, someone posted around 1947, Albert Einstein was not only working on his unified field theory, he was also working on Marilyn Monroe. Yes. Even though the world's greatest scientist was 47 years older than the 21-year-old budding actress and model, Einstein was one of Marilyn's ardent suitors. Is this relationship between the 20th century's best-known male and female icons documented? Yes. Well, now let's talk about him being a wife beater, okay? We have this article that says Einstein arrested twice in 1906 for domestic violence. Huh? He's beating up women. It goes on to say, in startling new evidence uncovered by biographer Hans Grossman, it appears that Albert Einstein, the revered scientist often acknowledged as the father of modern physics, was arrested twice in 1906 for domestic violence towards his wife at the time, Mileva. Now, let's go on further. Many people think that Einstein was a very kind and congenial fellow, explains Grossman, but the fact of the matter is that Albert Einstein was a habitual and compulsive adulterer who fathered some 15 children out of wedlock and a liar and often beat his wife for what appears to be the most insignificant matters. Huh? What do you guys have to say about that? This is your genius beating up women, a plagiarist, wife beater and womanizer. Huh? The second report continues Grossman indicates that one morning as Einstein exited the bathroom, his wife wished him a good morning at which, again, he flew into a fiery rage, pushing her in the face repeatedly and gouging her eyes. <laughs> this is your genius. This is your, your, you know, your supreme authority to physics. Gouging out a woman's eyes. Huh? Beating on a woman. What do you guys have to say about this? Huh? You gotta take him off of that damn pedestal. Gouging out her eyes <laughs> for saying good morning. What? This is ridiculous. All right. I wanna get into this section I call Why So Much Praise. So, in this article titled Jewish Fairy Tales, it talks about why they have been praising Einstein. It says here his actual commitment was Zionism. Ronald W. Clark mentions in Einstein's His Life and Times, Avon, 1971, page 377, he would campaign with the Zionists for a Jewish homeland in Palestine. On page 460, Clark quotes Einstein, As a Jew, I am from today a supporter of the Jewish Zionist efforts. This is why he gets so much praise. Doesn't matter that he's a plagiarist, a wife beater, a sociopath, a womanizer. Doesn't matter. He is in support of the Zionist agenda, so they have propped him up as the greatest, huh? A genius, well he's a friggin' idiot. Goes on to say that Ben Gurion offered Einstein the presidency of the newly founded state of Israel, but Einstein declined. They were offering him to be the president of Israel because he was in support of their agenda. Talk to me, come on. They put this clown's face on their currency. 1968, Albert Einstein on the five Israeli pounds. This article, it says here, Kurt Blumingfield recruited Einstein to Zionism in 1919. Though not without difficulty, Albert Einstein was very much for assertion of Jewish rights, but this conflicted with his lifelong opposition to militant nationalism. Blumenfield quoted him saying, I am against nationalism, but in favor of Zionism. The reason has become clear to me today when a man has both arms and he is always saying I have a right arm, then he is a chauvinist. However, when the right arm is missing, then he must do something to make up for the missing limb. Therefore, I am, as a human being, an opponent of nationalism. But as a Jew, I am from today a supporter of the Jewish Zionist efforts. Talk to me, guys. We're going to get down to the root of this. 
In October of 1919, he wrote to physicist Paul Epstein, Zionist cause is very close to my heart. I am very confident of the happy development of the Jewish colony and I'm glad that there should be a tiny speck on this earth in which the members of our tribe should not be aliens. Now after the assassination of Walter Rathenau, Einstein was quoted saying, I can remember very well the time when Jews in Germany laughed over Palestine. I remember when I spoke about Rathenau, about Palestine. He said, why go to this land that is only sand and worth nothing and which can never be developed? This was his idea. But if he had not been murdered, he probably would now be in Palestine. You can therefore see that the development of Palestine is of real tremendous importance for all of Jewry. Alright guys, that's pretty much my video. Be sure to subscribe, like, and share. And if you have a topic you want me to discuss, just shoot me an email and let's get it done. Until next time, this is Conspiracy Dude. Oh. 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 Oh.